Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You know what? I am going to, I'll tell you what, I'll skip uh, three verses and then we'll just read. I'm going to read this entire chapter because uh, it all comes into play. This is the Apostle Paul writing this, verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes, This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we, he's talking about the apostles, have the right to food and drink. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us? As do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers. And, and Cephas, which is Peter. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grape? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law, talking about the scripture, doesn't the scripture say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because when the plow man plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much that we reap material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, should we have it all the more? But... We did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. Am I not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me? I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharge, discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like those under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become the weak. To win the weak, I have become all things. To all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share his blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others... I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. <coughs> Amen. I pray that those words reach your ear, touch your heart, and change you as Scripture is meant to do so. Uh, I'll break this down here in a second because there's really one message here in this text that we want to focus on today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I served in the United States Marine Corps way back when, um, 88 to 92, so... Uh, some of you before, some of you were even born. Uh, I served in the first Persian Gulf War, uh, the Iraq War. Uh, Desert Shield was the name. Does everybody remember that? Desert Shield, Desert Storm. My job in the United States Marine Corps was a combat engineer. What that meant was I took out mines. <sighs> the enemy in Iraq used, actually it was Kuwait, they used mines to prevent the United States forces from coming into Kuwait to liberate the people. They built, they called it a line in the sand. I don't know if you remember back, they always talked about the line in the sand, but they, they called it a line in the sand. What the line in the sand was, was literally two minefields that was, went back to back. You had one, and then you had a little space, and then you had a second one that stretched for miles. 
And literally, you, if you walked, there was no way, I mean, we, we had a, a tank battalion, we had troops, and we had people that needed to get from Saudi Arabia into Kuwait. The only way that you could get to Kuwait from this side, of course, we had an ocean uh, attack too that was going to happen, was to go straight to the minefield. Not only did they put up these two minefields that were miles, miles long, but right behind the minefield, they put up their troops. And their troops were, I don't know, well equipped with AK-47s. We had M-16s. You know anything about weapons, you know that's not a fair match. M-16s in the desert, a little bit of sand, your bolts jam, you only got two shots. Where the AK-47, you can drop the thing in the sand, you can just rain down terror on the enemy. They were locked and loaded with two minefields to prevent anybody from coming into the um, to Kuwait to free the people. In fact, I remember, and I'll touch on this when I, when I finish the sermon, this will be your cue that I'm ending the message today. Um, we had a colonel. Right before we went in, he had a briefing. He called all of us up. We were going to be in the first wave of troops to hit this minefield, to take it out. And he sat us down, and they expected mass casualties with the United States Marines. So the colonel began his motivating speech, and he began to cry. And he started off his speech, I'm not going to cry, telling us about how 90% of us were going to be killed. And that don't worry, we have another unit who's going to replace you so that we'll get the job done. Remember thinking, well that sucks. I mean, I don't remember this being a motivating speech, but this was his way of saying, I'm proud of what you're about to do before you do it. It was a pretty good defense that the um, that I did. I mean, two great minefields and uh, cover it with fire, and you'd have to be insane to try to cross that line in the sand. The good thing was Marines are really far from sane individuals. And in less than two hours, we knocked six holes through that minefield, breached it, killed a lot of people. Captured a lot more. Widened it, and we were on our way to Kuwait within two hours. I'm not going to go into details how we did that. It's really cool. You ought to just Google line charges. How we could just go up straight there, shoot a missile across, and blow a path through it. It's very quite awesome. But what I want to illustrate today to you is this that it was probably, and I can't imagine what it would be like for the other side to see our unit come over. I mean, when we hit that hill, there was as far to the left as you could see, as far to the right as you could see, and as far deep as you could see, there was a line of tanks coming to you. I can't imagine what the Iraqis thought when they saw us coming. There's a song, we used to sing these songs in, 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 during PT. You better see us coming, better step aside. A many men, men, and a many men. Die. Great smoke. Now that's a motivating song. You don't have to cry when you sing it. I think the Iraqi troops learned something about Marines that day. Let me rephrase that. I think Iraq, Iraqi troops learned something about humanity that day. And it is this. If the goal is great enough, there is no obstacle big enough, bad enough, Deadly enough, that's going to stop them. What they meant as a line of steel turned out to be nothing more than a speed bump because the Marines thought it was a worthy goal, and I hope you would all agree, that the liberation of the Kuwaiti people was much higher. Do you agree that the liberation of the people is a good goal? Amen. Saving anybody is a good goal, I think. You see somebody drowning and laying them in the ground, you'll probably be criticized for it. Absolutely. I got to thinking about that this week. Because I was having a conversation with somebody. I may step on some toes right now because I thought, this, this just drives me crazy. It's just my persona. Uh, you'll, you'll have to forgive me in advance. But they were talking about how they wanted to, um, they wanted to open up a restaurant here in town. And, uh, 
they started talking about this type of restaurant. And I'm listening to him talking, and literally from the point where you come in and meet the, what is the person called that, that greets you? Host. The host, hostess. Anybody just shed a tear when the hostess went out of business? I don't know, the orange <laughs> cupcakes, I'm still, we pray for them, please. Orange cupcakes, at least somebody buys it. Anyway, the hostess greets you. From the time the hostess greets you to the time sitting down to the type of food this person described in intricate detail detail what this restaurant looked like. They talked about the lighting. They talked about everything about it. And I was just impressed. And of course, my other little side thing that I do, I'm, I'm encouraging the person. I said, dude, you need to build this restaurant. And then they said, I said, I can't. I said, dude, what do you mean you can't build this restaurant? He said, I got no money. I thought, you know, he's asking me for money. I said, well, you ain't getting any money from me. I said, well, why don't you go out and get you some money? And he's like, well, I can't. I said, why can't you get you some money? And he's like, I, I, know, I don't have any credit. And I don't even get me started on credit. So I'm just like, dude, work another job. Eat ramen noodles for six months. You can get you some money. I said, I said get you another job. Get you three jobs. I mean, this is a great goal. Make it happen. He's like, I can't. Why can't you? I got a time. Well, I was pretty much done with this guy. Because he was talking about a goal. And it was a really cool goal. But then he started blowing smoke for all the reasons why he couldn't do it. And I was thinking back in contrast to the Marines who had this line of steel that they had to go through with every expectation of being killed on the spot, but still going through because the, 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 the goal was that important, and you had this guy telling me he can't meet his goal because the obstacles are too big. And I got to thinking of this. He just doesn't have the willpower. You've heard the old slogan, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. But this guy... Good goal. But he just didn't have any will. And then I got to think a little bit more because I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's the goal. Maybe what's important is the goal. If the goal is noble, if the goal is worthy, then it doesn't matter what obstacles are in the way. You're going to make it happen. Maybe this guy's goal was just a restaurant. It's just like feeding people. Maybe that wasn't a good goal. But, then, but saving a person is, is so much more noble, and that's why... There's a difference. There's this contrast that I couldn't wrap my mind about. But then I started thinking some more. I know a lot of people, maybe, maybe you can testify this, I know a lot of people who have goals that are not what I would consider necessarily noble, but they still hit their goals no matter what the obstacles are. Let me try to explain this one. I don't believe, and I'm going to say this right now, that pursuing wealth is an evil goal. Okay? I don't believe it. I actually, I'm reading this great book. It's from a Jewish perspective where they're making an argument. I don't want to go there so much. I'm not willing to take this step. But they're, they make the argument that, that pursuing wealth and building that type of the company of business is actually a godly goal. They kind of, the way they approach the scripture, I'm not really, but they make a pretty good argument, okay? I'm not that type of guy. But I do know people who pursue money, they pursue millions of dollars, they pursue wealth with a passion because they have a very ungodly goal. I know that to be true. I know people who think that money is the key to happiness. Do you know this type of person? Say yes. 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 Okay. And I know, and I've seen these people with passion. Go after this with all they got. I know one guy who ate ramen noodles for like six months so he could save up just enough money for an investment. He popped on it and paid. He didn't go into debt to do it. And they hit their goal every... That, that, I mean, even if I know one guy who wants to be a multimillionaire, he's falling short, he just barely has a million dollars. Even if he's half wrong, I mean, he's, he's, he feels like he's doing okay. But then I meet other people who have some really noble goals. Christians. 
They want to do a Sunday school, or they want to do a Bible study, or they want to do something. They want to start a a food pantry, and they want they want to help the poor. They want to. I asked your kids today. I was talking about good gifts, and I said, if you were to receive ten million dollars, what would you do? And I was it was crazy over there. Most of them said, when they raised their hand, said, oh, I would buy me a nook. Your kids want a nook for Christmas, um, Sarah, and then I'd give the rest to the poor. Very cool. I know Christians who have godly goals, and I believe it's a godly goal. I believe there are Christians that have goals that God has given them and is in their will, but they are failures. Because the minute they begin, they begin opposition arises, and they stop. And they interpret it as a closed door. You've heard this, right? God closed the door on me. Let me just give you a piece of advice before we continue to go forward. If it is God's will for your life, a closed door is an obstacle. Okay? That's what you need to determine if it's God's will for your life. A obstacle is nothing more than the Red Sea. An obstacle is no, nothing more than a big wall outside the city of Jericho. Okay? An obstacle is nothing more than the Jordan River. You see, with some of my friends who are very secular, who have this secular and very worldly goal, and some, and some of them a very evil goal, and outside of God, the very opposite of what God tells them to do, they're hitting it, they're hitting it, and if they don't hit it, it's because their desire for the Christian, when they don't hit their goal, it's not just a matter of desire, but it's a matter of faith, too. You see, not only if, if you're a Christian and you have these good godly goals and you ain't hitting your goals, then I would say not only is your desire weak, but your faith is nothing. Because even if you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you'll be able to tell this mountain, get up, get in the ocean. Mountain gets up, gets in the ocean. Matter of fact. So it's not the nobility of the goal. It has to be the desire. Which I think is problematic from a pastoral viewpoint. Let me explain what I mean. What do you think the ultimate goal in life should be? Anybody? Take a shot at it. What? Not die. That's a good one. <laughs> That's pretty much the goal. Whenever I eat my wife's cooking, my goal is not to die. <laughs> She's here. No, no, I'm kidding. Last night with pepperonis is good. Uh, I think that your ultimate life goal, this is maybe the pastor, maybe tell me I'm wrong, has got to be to know Jesus Christ. That's it. Now you make a million dollars a night and you die, it doesn't really matter. Because eventually, the goal of not dying. Uh, statistics tell us everyone who has died at one time lived had that same goal, but 100% of them failed. <laughs> you will die. Or if your goal is to build an empire, your goal is to, 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 to feed the poor, if your goal is to, to make a name for yourself, to build a library or something like that, you'll, you'll eventually die. And most of you, I, and I will venture to say this, and, and I hope it's not sobering. All of you in this room, within two to three generations, nobody is going to know who you were. I, I mean, I'll bet you, some of you probably can't go back two to three generations to tell me people in your own family are so important to you. Ultimately, the most important goal in a lifetime is to know Jesus Christ. Jesus said, by the way, I'm not just making this up. He said, what good of it is to gain the whole world but to lose eternity? To lose your soul. Does that make any sense? So why is this problematic to desire? Does anyone really desire to know God? I, I had a guy the other day who talked to me. He said, you know what? I, 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 I'd like to start. I'd like to start that. He doesn't want to become a Christian. He said, I'd like to start understanding a little bit more about you Christians. I'd like to understand more about Jesus. What makes you tick? And that's, that's always good for me. I'm like, dude, man, come on. We'll start a Bible study tomorrow. We'll do a Bible study in my house. You come to church. Come to church this time. We'll go to church. And, and boom, you can start learning. He's like, no, 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 no. Wait a second. I ain't going to church. I said, well, here, pick up, here, here's the Bible. Look, start reading the Bible. Start, start with John. Y'all, it's a good book. Whoa, big book. 
probably don't really want to read that. Some of the most insignificant obstacles get in the way of people who don't know Christ from coming to Christ. Let me give you the theological description that backs that statement up. It's this. It's found in Romans. It says this. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. So my question is this. If no one really is seeking God, and God being the ultimate goal, knowing Jesus Christ the ultimate goal, but there is no desire, and desire really is the key to achieving your goal, how is it even possible for those to want to know Christ? Well, it's not. Nobody has the goal. If you have friends that you really want to see except Christ, and I hope you do, do you believe that saving people is important? Yeah, you already said it. Kind of set you up. If you have people that you want to see except Jesus Christ, they don't want them. They've got other goals. Because they don't want them, they have no desire to have them. John was doing a Bible study this Sunday and he was asking, well, what about these people? We had four different groups of people and he's like, how, how is it that you how is it that you reach out to these people? How is it that you share Christ with them? And here's the problem. None of them want to know God. You have a Mormon in your life, they don't want to know God. You have a Muslim in your life, they don't want to know God. You have an atheist, they don't want to know God. There are, nobody wants to know God. There's none who seek God. None is righteous. They all fall short of God. They don't want it. The biblical truth is that God chases after them. The Trinity, the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit says that there is one name, the, tri the Triune God. You have the Father, you have the Son, the Holy Spirit. All three of them work in unison, in eternal unison, chasing after people who don't want to have anything to do with Him. What a beautiful sight. You have the Father who sends the Son. You have the Son who obediently comes down and dies upon a cross. You have the Son who sends the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit who convicts the world. They have such a... It says in the Bible that, that God desires that all men be saved. Do you believe that is a worthy goal? It's a godly goal. I mean, do you really believe that? Or are you just playing lip service? Because that's the answer that you say inside of a church. Or if you know anything about the scriptures, you know the Son has given us a small command in the Bible. He says, you will be my. Why? They don't want it! 
No one seeks God. No one is righteous. I didn't say it. He did it. Come in here in the safety of this building. We scream out to the, the world. Come. Please come. No one's coming. By the way, it's not the job of the perishing to save themselves. It's always the job who's... It's always the one who has been commissioned to do the saving. It's the job Amen. to do it. Not save yourself. That's what Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 10, 14. He says, how then can they call on the one they not believe? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So my question to the church is this. Is it a worthy goal to save someone? Yay or nay? Is your desire for saving someone so great that whatever obstacle comes in your way, you have the faith to move? Is your, is your desire to see someone outside of those doors come to a saving faith, which we all agree is the number one thing that a person can do in their lifetime, is your faith so great that whatever obstacle is out there that prevents them from coming or from you preaching so great that your faith causes you to move. What do I mean by faith causes you to move? I am so sick and tired of hearing brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ say, I have faith and I'm going to wait for God to move an obstacle. But throughout the Bible, over and over and over and over again, you no know obstacles are moved until you take a step. The Jordan is not parted until you put your foot in the water. 5,000 people were not fed until you break bread. God said to Abraham, he said, kill your son, your only begotten son. Abraham said, well, I don't know how this is going to work. He said that through all the nations, this, this, this boy is going to bring, he's going to bring all the nations, but maybe, oh, I, I guess you can raise him from the dead. So here's my sword. Boom. God said, stop. Now I know you have faith. Why? Because you moved. Do you have the faith to move in such a way that you'll move every obstacle? During World War II, they told the United States Marines, they said, as you approach these minefields and these, these, these death traps, your body is not going to want to move forward. Because it's just not natural. So you have to claw out and you have to bring yourself and keep pulling yourself towards the enemy. Do you have enough faith that even though there is a solid wall of steel to keep moving, to bust down the obstacles? Because what's important is saving somebody outside those walls. If you say yes... church, then I really don't want to hear any more time spent talking about obstacles. Please stop saying there's not enough time to do what we're called to do. Shut up about the money. Shut up about the building. I don't care what it's like. I really don't. Don't tell me we only got a few people and we can only do so much. Wham! Is, is it God's will people be saved? I mean, that's what we have to determine first. Is it God's will? Has He given us the command to do it?
Because the only way he's gonna, the only way you're gonna stop weeping is by God doing that. But then it's too late. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul says, I beat my body, I beat it into submission, I, I make it a slave, so I'm not disqualified for the prize. What is the prize? We get a cool robe in heaven? No, in context, the prize is that some people might be saved. People are the prize. If they don't remove obstacles, we have to remove obstacles. I love the first part of that, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul gives this elegant argument why somebody who works in the ministry should receive a paycheck. But that's not the purpose of him making that foundational argument. He says, I have the right to have a paycheck. I have the right to have a wife. I have the right to reap the benefits... And not have to worry about how I'm going to pay my bills. But I'm not taking that right. Why? Because to some people it's an obstacle to saving faith. You know, I can deflate and I pray and I pray and I pray that one day I can tell this church, I don't want your paycheck. Put it back in the offering. I'm going to work my tail off that day. You know how much I can defeat a person when I go out there and say, church just wants my money. I'm like, I don't want your stinking money because I won't get your money. What I want is you to know Jesus Christ. They think we're about money. I do. Do you have enough faith to tear down obstacles? All them excuses that we give. Well, I don't have the words to say. I'm not gifted. I don't know enough. What if they know all this? Do you have the faith to tear down your own obstacles that you put there? You put there. He told you to be obedient. He'll give you the words to say. It's the Holy Spirit that works through you. Do you have enough faith to tear down those obstacles by opening up your mouth? Does this church have enough faith to tear down the obstacles? This church was unknown at one time. We tore that obstacle down, now it's known. What about this thing with the Baptist? The Baptist is talking about changing their name. What's the name, Brother Randy, that they want to change it to? The Great Commission Church? Great Commission Baptist. Yeah, but they said the Baptist was, was what? No, it's Great Commission Baptist. Great Commission Baptist. But they're, they're just, they're wanting to change the name, stuff like that. Like, I don't think in this community... One single person is outside the walls and say, oh, they're Baptists, they handle snakes, because they know that we handle scorpions, not snakes. Um, but some communities, the name Baptist is a roadblock. Would you be willing to get rid of that roadblock? doesn't matter, Paul is saying. It's that important. Whatever obstacle is in front of me, and, or an obstacle not only is going to prevent me from sharing the gospel, but whatever obstacle gets in front of them in accepting the gospel, I have to be about tearing it down. Let me tell you the number one obstacle that people have in this world about coming to Jesus Christ. And Gandhi said it best. Jesus I like, it's your Christians I can do without. You know what Paul says to win the Jew, I become a Jew. To win, to win the Gentile, I become a Gentile. To win those under the law, I become. When he says, I will become whatever it takes so that by all possible means I might save someone. someone. You know what he was saying? Let me clarify this. He wasn't saying I'm going to change the gospel. No, 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 no. You change the goal. You can't change the goal. The goal is the goal. Is the goal. You change the goal, it's no longer the goal, and it's something else. The path towards salvation is narrow, and, and very few accept it. The path towards destruction is wise. You change the goal, you just put it over to this side. It's destruction. You change Jesus so it's more palatable. He becomes a false Jesus who can't say a left. But he says, I will do whatever it takes. I will not force them to come in here and play on my field. I will go out there and play on their field. Their terms, their turf. What does that mean? You know, we, we Christians, we get so caught up on the particulars that we fail even get to the message. 1920s, our gospel message, the Baptist gospel message was this, you better not be drinking beer. It was alcohol. Look at, look at your contracts. 
That's the focus. What is it today? We're like a one sin wonder. Homosexuality. I'm not saying that we say that it's not a sin, but I've got some great books that, that describe what non-Christians think about Christians. And let me tell you what they think about you. One, you're hypocrites. Two, you're Republicans. Three, you're scared of gay people. <coughs> Every time you go out that door and you open your mouth, as soon as you do, that's how they identify you. Why do we fight on the insignificant when our message should be one thing? Jesus Christ, Him crucified. John and I, we, we, we the, the, uh, our Chinese scholars who are going to be here next week, you could start, let's, let's begin our Bible study with creation. You will not lead them to Christ. Why? Because you are stupid if you believe in creation. Well, I disagree. But tell you what, let's start with Jesus. And I'll let him worry about the creation and evolution argument. You'd be surprised when you lead someone to Christ over time. That, you know, that, that's a second nature. What about tattoos? The, the young man who who gets the tattoos, and you get so fixated on a cultural thing, you never get around to saying the message. We get so caught up on the little things, the, 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 the small things of this world, we never get around to preaching Jesus Christ crucified. I tell you what, I'm an entrepreneur. I, am, I have this entrepreneur spirit. I am never, ever since I was in the military, I got a military. I don't do well working with a boss. I mean, you guys are my boss, but I don't do well. I need to be alone. I, you need to leave me alone so that I can just, just do stuff. I have my own business. I mean, I'm okay not having a boss. So, God has called me to preach the gospel to poor people. I don't go into poor circles and say, you people really need to get off your tails and start creating your own business and create this empire right there before I can even ex accept it to talking to Jesus. No, I, go, I, I study, I read, I, I, I get the different manuals, I read books from um, uh, uh, noted African-American uh, authors about the condition of inner city poor people so I can understand their position, so I can go on their level, so I can preach the gospel. Why? Because I believe if they die, they go to hell. Do you. So much so that you work to remove the obstacles. Right before we crossed that line in the sand, that colonel, he came out and he gave us that, that motivating speech. Tears coming from his eyes. Saying, you Marines are going to hit that, you're going to hit that line. Your M16 A2s are not going to be able to work. We've got the tanks, we'll take out these sites, A, B, and C. The problem is the AK-47s are going to mow you down. Had it not been for the fact that they that the enemy simply gave up when they saw the size of us coming, who knows if I'd be here today. I mean, it, it, it was predicted to be a slaughter. They just gave up. Even though he gave us probably the worst motivational speech I've ever heard in my life, we went. You know why? Two reasons. One, because we were ordered to do so. Number two, because we're going to save some people. Church needs to shut up about saying they love God if they will not do what he says. Why do you say, Lord, Lord, don't do what I say. Go, 
You'll be my witness. Church needs to shut up about how much they love people outside their walls if they will not go be about saving. Why? That's the definition of a hypocrite. Playing lip service. My prayer for 2013, that is the next year, right? 2013? Everybody say, how old are you? I always say, what year is it? Is that God will either remove this church from the equation and bring in another body of believers who will be a witness to a dying people. Or that He renews our desire and our passion to reach the lost to the extent that we are willing to go up to whatever obstacle that prevents us from sharing the gospel or from them hearing the gospel and with the intensity of a United States Marine blow that obstacle out of the waters so that we can reach maybe, maybe just one. No excuses. Just obedience. Let's pray. You are God. We are not. You love the whole world so much that you sent your only begotten Son to die on a cross. To be stripped of His clothes, beaten beyond recognition, humiliated in front of the masses, spit on by, them, by people who are not worthy to even tie the shoes of your lowest servants. You died for us. Why? Because that's what it needed. Because there is no other way except for Jesus Christ. No other way. No plan B. That's it. He did it because hell is real. He did it because he knows that if we die without him, separation is for eternity. He did it because we had to. He left 99 to preach one. He left everything he had for one. He is the woman who's after that one gold coin. We are that gold coin. He is the shepherd after all of that one sheep. We are that one sheep. And you've commissioned us, the great commission, to go into the world, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching everything that you've commanded. And you've given us a promise. You'll be with us always. Father God, I believe this in my heart. And I believe this is true from the scriptures. That the promise that you will be with us always. Is contingent. Upon the command to go. That if we don't go. We've turned our back on you and we've walked away from you. But if we go, we walk hand in hand with the Lord Almighty as the Holy Spirit works through us. We want to be a church in that relationship, that intimate relationship with you. We're walking hand in hand. We have to be obedient. God forgive us for our disobedience. Woe to us. If we don't preach the gospel. It is in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Brother Greg, if you could lead us.